Wall Street slips and treasuries jump as hawkish commentary from St. Louis Federal President uh, Bullard stokes fears of more aggressive rate hikes. Bullard says previous hikes have had a limited impact on inflation, suggests rates are not as restrictive as necessary. Asian markets are higher after stronger than expected consumer core inflation data from Japan. The street is also closely watching the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The SGX Nifty indicates a muted start for the Indian market. Oil prices dip over $3 a barrel on concerns over more hawkish policy action from the U.S. Uh, Fed and the surge in COVID cases in China. Brent around $90 a barrel after slipping below the level overnight. And sources say TPG Capital also looks to sell 1,000 crore rupees worth of shares in Nike through a block deal today as the new age company sees a massive selling spree post the end of its lock-in period. UK government announces massive spending cuts and tax hikes in its £55 billion fiscal plan even as it faces its longest ever recession on record. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt confirms Britain is in a recession, says the economy is expected to shrink 1.4% next year against the earlier outlook for growth. The sterling falls against the US dollar post the announcement. Hi guys, a very good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast. I'm Pavitra Parikh. Those are all of the top headlines that we're tracking for you this morning. So clearly there's been a lot that's going on, especially in the global markets. So let's take a look at how some of those are faring right now. Asia is starting largely higher. In fact, all markets in Asia except for the Shanghai are in the green right now. So it's looking like quite a positive start. Hang Seng is eight tenths of a percent um, in the green. Taiwan also up for you. It's around a quarter of a percent higher. And a few of the other ones, of course, we seeing gains of seven tenths of a percent. You have Nikai holding up with gains of two tenths of a percent. And across the board, it's looking quite good. Like I said, uh, Shanghai is the only one which is trading absolutely flat right now. Just a little bit of a minor uh, downtick. The SGX Nifty is up on your screen. It's indicating a good start for our own markets. We're currently around 50 points in the green on the SGX Nifty. So that's what's happening in Asia. But let's also talk about the US markets then. Wall Street ended a volatile trading session lower. Uh, this after hawkish comments came in from St. Louis Federal President President James Bullard and also some pos uh, positive quarterly results which came through. So the Dow Jones was absolutely flat after dropping more than 300 points in early trade. The S&P 500 as well as the tech heavy Nasdaq closed with uh, some cuts of around three tenths of a percent each. CNBC's Frank Holland is here with a wrap of all of that action. Generally, modest losses on Wall Street today. As a key Federal Reserve official said, the central bank has a lot more work to do to get inflation under control. That means more interest rate increases that could put the economy into recession. The Dow finished very near unchanged. The S&P closed down three-tenths of 1%, and the Nasdaq also ended the day with a three-tenths of 1% loss. General Motors says incentives in the Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act will make electric vehicles as profitable as gasoline-powered cars and trucks by 2025, and that's years ahead of the original schedule. And in a bankruptcy filing, the executive brought in to clean up the mess at crypto exchange FTX says he has never seen such a complete failure of financial controls with company money used to buy expensive homes in the name of top employees and personalized emojis used to improve some expenses. That's the action from the U.S. market. Back to you in Mumbai. All right, Frank, thanks a lot for getting us all of that action from the U.S. markets. In fact, let's also bring you some opinion on the market. This is from Meera Pandit of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. We don't want to rule anything out if inflation does stay persistently high, but we are seeing signs of improvement on inflation. I think the report that we got recently from CPI couldn't have really been better. Uh, realistically, if we think about some of the progress we made on goods, on commodities, on supply chain, some areas of services, even owner's equivalent rent went from scorching hot to kind of just boiling hot. So we're making some progress. We don't want to make too much out of just one report because we could very well see a backslide. But I think it is very important for the Fed to continue to, to message tough so we don't see too much of an easing in financial conditions and we don't see the markets get too ahead of themselves. All right, that is some important opinion coming in on the markets and how they're likely to trend from here. But, you know, like I was telling you, sentiment on Wall Street really weakened after hawkish comments came through from uh, Fed officials, most notably from St. Louis Federal President James Bullard, who said that rates are not yet sufficiently restrictive, uh, restrictive and could actually rise to 7%. CNBC Steve Leesman is here with more on what he said. Yeah, some harshly hawkish comment this morning from Fed, uh, St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard, who suggests that the federal funds rate 
may need to rise as high as 7%. Bullard said in a speech that using a common rule for monetary policy, the Taylor rule, yields a low end of 5% for the peak funds rate to bring down inflation. That's using a series of dovish inputs that he doesn't even seem to believe. Using the more hawkish scenario, it could go as high as 7%. The two-year note soared on these comments, as did the outlook for the peak funds rate, now back around 5%, had been below 490 after those better inflation numbers we got this week. And last, here's a problem for the Fed, is that the economy doesn't seem to be weakening enough to bring down inflation. Uh, yesterday, we got those strong retail sales numbers. Forecasters we surveyed in our rapid update boosted their fourth quarter GDP outlook to near 2% from one3 showing if you look at the two uh, halves of the year, the economy clearly accelerated rather than slowed down despite aggressive Federal Reserve rate hikes. All right, Steve, thanks a lot for getting us all of the details. But with that, let's also move on and talk about the European markets, which fell for a second straight day as investors focused on geopolitics and a big budget announcement in the UK. So Rishi Sunak's new British government has unveiled its long-awaited fiscal plan. It proposes sweeping spending cuts and also several tax hikes. Remember, Sunak's uh, predecessor, Liz Truss, lasted barely 45 days in the job after roiling the market with her tax cuts. So Sanjay Suri is here with more on what Sunak's fiscal plan looks like right now. As expected, we are seeing a tax rise, and this is going to hit the somewhat higher earners particularly harder. We are also seeing spending cuts across the board, and the idea is that these two between them together, with the interest rate hike from the Bank of England earlier, would limit the spending money among people in a bid to bring down inflation, not to bring down prices necessarily, but to reduce the rate at which they are rising and to limit the extent to which they may rise. And of course, we know that the tax rate increases are needed to help to balance the government's books a little. This government is quite deep in debt, and if not deal with that imbalance even appreciably, at least to reduce the imbalance somewhat. The danger, of course, is rather obvious that this can potentially limit growth, and this is a danger particularly for Britain. Britain is at the bottom of the league among the developed countries on GDP. All of them have registered a growth. Britain alone has registered a fall. It is sliding into a recession, and the Bank of England has warned that this recession could last another two years. And if this policy then limits growth, this then could become seriously damaging for British economy. And if it does, then seriously damaging for Rishi Sunak and his prospects and his performance as prime minister. All right, Sanjay, thanks a lot for getting us all of the details. We'll, of course, keep coming back to you for updates on how the UK situation is playing out. But that's everything that's happening globally. Let's talk about how, uh, how our markets are likely to open all of the cues and news that you should track as we get into a fresh trading session. We have Mangalam, Vivek and Vahishta joining us now to take us through the trade setup and prep us up for this fresh trading session. Guys, a very good morning to all of you. And Vivek, let me come across to you first. We have been going through the global market setup, but take us through everything we should track today. Well, absolutely. You know, on the back of uh, some of the hawkish commentary, you actually saw most of the U.S. markets, most of the global markets uh, ending the session with in the red, uh, you know, actually giving way to a bit of underperformance after the sharp outperformance we saw. Uh, most of the UN, U.S. markets ended lower. However, they closed reasonably well off the session lows. We're coming closer to uh, the European markets. European markets, too, on the back of multiple developments in U.K., also ended largely lower in the session. Gold prices uh, stayed, you know, pro down around 0.7 percent. Crude prices, however, fell quite significantly. WTI futures fell over 4 percent in the session yesterday, and Brent futures fell over 3 percent in the session. Now, when you're coming closer home, some of the important cues to watch out for after the close of Q2, our market is looking for, for you know, struggling to find fresh direction. Yesterday, you did see during the weekly expiry a significant sell-off in the last hour of the session. And also, one important uh, development that will happen in today's trading session is the announcement of the Sensex as well as the FTSE rejig. So any developments in terms of inclusions and exclusion into the Sensex and also any fresh uh, inclusions into the FTSE is something that the markets will watch. Asian markets uh, as well as LGX Nifty indicating a mild cap of opening for the Indian markets. 
All right, Vivek, thanks a lot for getting us all of the cues. So it looks like the start will be in the green, but let's see how the session moves from there. We also have Vahishta now. Vahishta, take us through some of the individual stocks we should keep on our radar. Hi, Pavitra. Good morning. The first is Vedanta, which will be considering and approving the third interim dividend for FI23. Moving on to Bharat Electronics. Some positive news. Signed a memorandum of understanding with Advanced Weapons and Equipment India Limited, which is a defense PSU. And this is to jointly address the requirements of the Indian defense and the exports market. On similar lines, signed another memorandum of understanding with Armored Vehicles Nigam Limited, which is also a defense PSU, also to address the requirements of the Indian defense and the export markets. Moving on to Ultratech, which has commenced the company's third Birla White wall care putty plan which is in Rajasthan at a total cost of approximately 187 crores and Mahindra Life Sciences which has launched its residential project at Pimpri Chinchwood which is in Pune. The last stock is Blue Dart which is on an expansion spree right now with the launch of 15 retail stores across India. Back to you. All right, Vaishda, thanks a lot for that. We're going to keep these stocks on our radar. Finally, it's over to Mangalam, who's looking at all of the cues from the futures and options space. Hi, Mangalam. Good morning. So yesterday was the weekly options expiry, and the Nifty actually fell in the last 20 minutes itself on account of that. In fact, uh, the reason why it fell was because, you know, the Nifty, once it fell below that 18,350 mark, those who had written that 18,350 put had to cover their positions, and as a result of which, the decline was a little more accelerated. But that is done away with because the expiry is over, and now the SGX Nifty is indicating a positive start for our market. And that was the only drama that we saw, uh, you know, in an, in an otherwise extremely range-bound session for our markets yesterday. And that is likely to continue today as well, around that 18,400 mark. Why do I say that? Well, because while the FIs and DIs both buying in the cash market, we had the FII sell in index futures to the tune of almost 408 odd crores. And as a result of which, their longs are still maintained around that 64, 65% mark, which shorts at around 36%. The next week will be important and perhaps a little Little more volatile than this one. That's primarily because we have the November series expiry next week. And why is it important? Because 18,300 put as well as the 18,300 call, both of them extremely active for next week. 155 rupees on the 18,300 call, and we have the 18,300 uh, put, which has close to around uh, you know 100 odd rupees in terms of open uh, in terms of the premium. So that means about 250 odd rupees in terms of a combined premium for those who are looking to write the 18,300 call and put, which is a straddle put together. So that means the options uh, uh, writers are actually playing for an 18,250 to sort of 18,550 range on the index itself. All right, uh, that is on the market setup. Mangalam, Vahishta, Vivek, thank you all very much for joining us and taking us through that. But with that, it's time for our first short break on the show. When we come back, sources say that TPG will sell a chunk of its stake in Nika. So details on that story when we come back. Hey guys, welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast. Now let's talk about some individual stocks which could be in focus mm. today. As the company sees a massive selling spree after its pre-IPO lock-in period ends, sources are now telling us that TPG Capital looks to sell 1,000 crore rupees worth of shares in Nika through a block deal today. So Vivek is here to tell us more about that. Vivek? Well, good morning. That's right. So as soon as you know the lock-in has ended, uh, for some of these newer listings, uh, what you're actually seeing is that uh, some of the investors are looking to sell their stake and you know it's been a spate of block deals that we've seen across some of these companies yesterday we did see some significant block deals happen in Paytm and today it's the turn of Nika now remember Nika after November 11th you've actually seen every day you've seen some significant block deals happening so what we are understanding from our sources today is that uh, one of the major holders TPG capital is looking to sell close to thousand crores worth of stake in the company that uh, comes to around 1.9 percent of the total uh, shareholding of the entire company so thousand crores worth of uh, equity is expected to change hands today now interestingly the floor price of this particular block is set at 184.55 rupees a share which indicates a very minor discount of just around 0 0.6 to yesterday's closing price so it will be interesting to see you know how exactly this particular deal goes through now we've actually seen quite a long list of block deals that happened in Nika Canadian pension fund yesterday bought in uh, you also saw day for yesterday lighthouse selling close to three crore shares in the company on November 15th you saw Seganti India Mauritius selling almost 33.7 lakh shares in the company and TPG itself on November 11th actually sold a significant stake.
All right, Vivek, thanks a lot for all of the details. Let's see how this block deal uh, moves from here. By the way, the stock has really not done uh, well this week. It's down around 8% in just the past five days. But with that, we're going to move on and bring you an update on the government's divestment plans. Sources say that the government is seeking an extension to meet the 25% minimum public shareholding norm for IDBI Bank. This is post the privatization, while expressions of interest for container corps take sale are likely to be invited by December. So Sapna is here with the details on both of these. Sapna. So first, of course, we are given to understand the government is not having any plans to change the December 16 uh, deadline in terms of receiving the expressions of interest for IDBI Bank privatization. Uh, there is no plan to change that. So they're sticking to that December 16 uh, timeline as of now. Second, of course, uh, in terms of uh, the IDBI Bank meeting the minimum public shareholding norm of 25% post privatization, what we're given to understand is that uh, discussions are still on in terms of seeking additional time for that, maybe a two-year window, a three-year window. There's nothing specific that we can uh, speak about right now. But it'll have to be a longer timeline that will have to be given to the bank post privatization, of course. At some point in time, there's also a discussion that, you know, maybe the government's share in IDBI Bank and LIC's share in IDBI Bank, uh, you know, that could have been considered as public shareholding by SEBI. But now we are going to understand that the option has been dropped. Hence, we are back to square one in terms of seeking additional time to meet that 25% norm by the bank post privatization. Last but not the least, also in terms of uh, the SEBI notification, in terms of pricing of open offers uh, for privatization, so we are given to understand that that's going to be the same as the bid price. This has not been notified. So this is also a positive for IDBI Bank's take sale. Uh, you know, uh, the price at which the bid comes in and is accepted, uh, the strategic buyer will have to quote the same price for the open offer and this is going to apply for all privatizations in the future. Also, uh, in terms of uh, Shipping Corp and Concord, well, we are given to understand the government may be in a position to come out with the, or rather invite the expressions of inter interest for Concord privatization by December. And uh, BEML, BEML and SCI, we are given to understand, well, uh, they will be calling for the financial bids before this current financial year is over. All right, Sapna, thanks a lot for getting us all of the updates on the divestment plans for IDBI as well as Concord. But with that, it's time for a short break on the show. When we, when we come back, we're going to shift focus to the world of commodities. There's been a big slip in crude prices. We'll tell you what's going on. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast. And let's talk about the commodity space because there's a lot going on there as well. Manisha Gupta joins us with that update. Manisha, good morning. Big slip in oil prices. Oh, well, yes, uh, nearly 4% of a decline overnight, and we are down by nearly 7% now. And this week itself for the crude prices, and this is after we saw more than 3% of decline in the previous week as well. So it has been a constant decline for a fortnight now for the crude oil prices, trading at around $90 per barrel. And this comes in on the back of Chinese demand concerns as the COVID cases have risen to 23,000. This is the highest since the month of April, and that really is bothering the demand market there. NATO also has cleared Russia of the missile attack in Poland, so that geopolitical tension or the premium that was building on crude prices also seems to be getting off. Oil flows from Russia to Hungary through the Drizba pipeline also have resumed after two days of shutdown. So the markets are looking at supplies coming back. A lot of longs that had gone in in case of crude oil prices seem to be closing their positions as well. Also, the U.S. manufacturing activity declined to lowest since 2011. So the economic data is not supportive as well. So all the long positions, uh, as I said, which, which were building up in case of crude oil prices, seem to be easing before we head towards the weekend. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for bringing us that update. But with that, we're out of time on this edition of Power Breakfast. Thank you very much for tuning in. Bazaar Morning Call comes up next.